This is the Dollamore Daily, and I'm Jesse Dollamore. I talk about a number of different topics on this show. I have the luxury and the privilege to have a platform from which I'm able to discuss things that I'm passionate about. More than anything, I'm passionate about people, about equality, about equity in our society, about historic wrongs and injustices and oppression that have gone on over the course of prior to even our being a nation, whether it be native indigenous peoples of our nation, African Americans kidnapped, stolen people brought here and abused. I was going to do a video today because of all of the nuttiness that's going on with Donald Trump, all of the many things that could be discussed But I host a podcast, and yesterday on the podcast, my co-host and I, Brittany Page, interviewed a man named Robert P. Jones, who just released a book called White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And we, we talked about this book for about an hour. And I'm going to forego a video today to play in its entirety the podcast episode, the audio of the podcast episode, which will follow here. Because it is important. It is important if you're a white Christian to face the crimes against your fellow man and woman that have taken place. The crimes against those humans that have been overlooked, that have been facilitated by white Christian Americans. This isn't an indictment of Christianity as a whole. This is a call to action. If you sit in a pew on Sunday morning, shoulder to shoulder with white people, this is an opportunity for you to right historic wrongs, to steer the ship in a different direction, a direction toward equality. Anyway, I would invite you to not only subscribe to the podcast, I doubt it, with Dollamore, but also to earnestly and with an open heart listen to this content. This guy is not some angry atheist. He's a member of your church. He's a white Protestant Christian man who has a scholarly outlook backed up with statistics and history and data and research and personal experience. Anyway, uh, thank you. I will see you next time. I appreciate you all so much. Be genuine. Take care of one another. The following broadcast may contain free thinking and open-minded discussion, ideas, skepticism, and adult subject matter. Topics will be discussed using adult language, sometimes gratuitously. Get ready to move the conversation forward. This ain't your granddad's news and comment show. This is I Doubt It with Dollamore. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. This very special bonus episode of I Doubt It with Dollamore. I am your host, Jesse Dollamore, joined today by the lovely, the talented, and the scholarly Brittany Page, everybody. Now, this is one I'm excited about. Yeah. Yeah. This, I, is, this is a wheelhouse episode. Yes, meaning <laughs> that uh, the topic is in the wheelhouse. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. In our collective wheelhouse. Yes. I mean, this touches on all the bases that I'm, that I'm fascinated by. We, we talk about, uh, Christianity and politics and white supremacy in Christianity. I mean, it's just, uh, it's an amalgam of things that are not just interesting, but also critically important. 
it. Yeah. Especially today. Yeah. So I have followed Robert P. Jones for a long time on Twitter and saw that he recently wrote this book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Fascinating book. Had to get it. Had to read it. Read it. It took me a little bit because (laughs) there's so much information in here. I mean, there's a lot of historical research. There's also stats that he references from his own organization, PRRI, Public Religion Research Institute. Should I just read the... The, the, the pre-formulated bio that I have here for him. I mean, that would be the professional thing to do. <laughs> we don't typically do that, but sure. All right, let me, let me give it a shot here. Yeah. Robert P. Jones is the founder and CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute, or PRRI, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. Robert is a leading scholar and commentator on religion, culture, and politics. He's the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity and The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Graymeyer Award in Religion. Jones writes regularly on politics, culture, and religion for The Atlantic, NBC Think, and other outlets. And he is frequently featured in major national media such as CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and they didn't. They didn't write I Doubt It with Dollamore podcast. Uh, <laughs> well, they will now. I'm a little I'm a little offended. They will now. He holds a PhD in religion from Emory University, a Master of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a BS in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. Yeah. That is Seems one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> well, since he runs the the research institute, I'm sure that that's that that information is helpful there. That background, oh yeah, statistics and stuff. So yeah. smart, smart guy. Yeah, he in the, the title of those books, the titles of those books, you may start to think, is this an atheist that you're having on? I mean, you have the the end of white Christian America. What's that about? Well, that one's about the demographic changes that are going to cause this country to no longer be a majority yeah. white Christian nation. So it's not as though the book is calling for an end to white Christian America. And then you have this book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy. And that is a criticism yeah, right, of Christianity. But A he, well-founded, well-argued criticism. Yes. And he is still a man of faith. And is not an atheist. And the argument here is not about pulling people away from Christianity or converting people out of their faith. That's not the argument here. So I think that's what's really fascinating about this book and really powerful about Robbie is that he's able to communicate from this group and critique and say, these are the problems this is what we need to do. I'm a member of this group. Please yeah. join me yeah. in having this conversation and doing this work. It is. It's kind of a, the calls coming from inside the house yeah. situation where he's, it's a call to action for his fellow right. white Christians. Absolutely. So anyway, we had a really good time with the interview. He's a fantastic guest, a super smart guy, rolled with the punches, having to deal with me asking him questions. And, you know, we got to give him a... What's the opposite of a demerit? He's a gold star. We'll give him a gold star. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, we'd love to know what you think at the end of this. Thanks for joining us. Let's get to the interview. Robert P. Jones, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, The the first thing, we're just jumping right in. Uh, I know you cover it in the book, but for the audiences at Edification, we've we've already talked about your bio a little bit, but um, tell us a little bit about your background and how influential Christianity has been, like, in your early life and leading you to, to, to write the book. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I grew up Southern Baptist um, in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, most of my life. Um, and, you know, I was that kid who was at church, like, five times a week. Um, so it, it was very central, um, you know, to my upbringing, to my understanding of who I was, to how I saw the world to what I saw as what was important, you know, both in my daily life and in life in general. Um, so, you know, it was, it was very central. I, I you know, I, in addition to kind of going to church that often and being that connected to church all the way through my, even my teenage years, 
you know, I went to a Southern Baptist college um, and then I went to a Southern Baptist seminary. So I have a master of divinity degree from a Southern Baptist seminary uh, before uh, doing my PhD work at, at, at Emory, which is the first kind of higher education institution that wasn't Southern Baptist um, mm. uh, that I'd been to. When I was reading your book, I was struck by your discussion of how you really re- you really weren't aware of issues related to race, that that wasn't really talked about within the church. And it had Jesse and I reflecting on our own experiences growing up mm. in Christianity and whether we were aware of racial conversations or the relationship between religion and race and just a, a bit about our backgrounds to, to orient you to where we're coming from. Uh, my initial experience with Christianity and race was that my parents were actually white supremacists and uh, mm. moved like, us like real, not like kitchen table racists. Yeah, like their lives were dedicated to the proposition of yeah white supremacy. Yeah, like moved um, us from California to Idaho to go to Aryan Nations, and out in front of Aryan Nations, it actually said Church of Jesus Christ Christian Aryan Nations. So mm-hmm. I had a more explicit experience growing up with that, but Jesse, it wasn't so explicit for you. No, I, I mean I grew up in largely white communities and largely white churches, uh, briefly in the South in Missouri and Arkansas, but largely. And mostly in, in the Pacific Northwest in Idaho. And I, there was never a conversation about race. There was mm. never, I mean, it was always a bunch of white people, mm-hmm. you know, worshiping their white Jesus. And I'm, your book is fascinating to me because a lot of the dirty parts or the, the unsavory, not really talked about parts of the Bible are, you know, there we talk about them all the time both here on the on the on the podcast and on my youtube channel but um it seems that there's also this this propensity to not talk about the actual more contemporary history of the church and those dirty parts do you do you find that to be true or any linkage between those two yeah i think that's right i mean you know so again i i grew up in the southern baptist convention you know so if there's if there's any major you know branch of uh, Christianity that's most explicitly connected to slavery, um, you know, the uh, kind of this very violent form of, of white supremacy, um, it's Southern Baptist, um, mm-hmm. right? And and so, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the genesis story of, of the denomination is that in 1845, there was a dispute between Northern and Southern Baptists, um, you know, literally Baptists in the North and Baptists in the South over the issue of slavery. And the churches in the South put put forward a candidate uh, to be a missionary uh, who was a slave owner. Um, And that was a very intentional move to kind of test the commitment of Northern Baptists. And when they rejected him, um, there was this split and the Northern uh, Baptists said, no, we can't do that in good conscience. And the the Baptists in the South said, fine, we'll form our own denomination, uh, which they did in 1845. Um, and th- that denomination, you know, was the one I ended up growing up in. And in fact, by the middle of the 20th century, it had become the largest Protestant denomination of any kind um, in the country that, you know, this one that was explicitly founded, um, you know, to support slavery. And I never heard that story at all. Again, and if anyone would have heard it, it wouldn't have been me. I was there for most every sermon, most every Sunday school lesson, most every Bible study, mm-hmm. um, and not not a word. Right about about that beginning of, of our denomination. It wasn't until I was in my twenties in seminary uh, that I really even uh, you know first heard this this story. Do you think that's just kind of a, a continuation of the pattern and practice of ignoring the parts that aren't flattering on uh, the doctrine or the denomination? Um, yours being Southern Baptist. Yeah, yeah. I realized I didn't get to the contemporary part, but you know, so I, I grew up. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm fifty two. I was born in nineteen sixty eight, and I. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I remember in the 1970s uh, when I was in elementary school, um, I actually remember the first African-American kids showing up as the Jackson, Mississippi Public School District finally desegregated nearly 20 years after Brown yeah. Board of Education. Yeah. Um, and yet and when that, so that event happens. Right. It's a major event. Um, and even as that event happened, as I was in second and third grade, there was no conversation at church about like even what was going on. Why are all the African American kids showing up at our, at our schools and why is there some tension and, and what was the history, right. Of not only um, resisting um, allowing African American kids to go to uh, mostly to, to white schools, 
but even even to keeping African Americans out of our own sanctuaries. I mean, that that history was like right there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, none of that, none of that conversation. The role that, um, you know, I, I think when you when you hear the word church and civil rights, um, everyone thinks about the role of black churches that served as hubs of organizing and and supporting kind of staging areas for protest uh, for the civil rights movement for Martin Luther King Jr. and others. Uh, but very few people, and and I, I certainly didn't. Uh, very few white people think about the 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 opposite role that that most white Christian churches took, and that is to be uh, places of either silent or active resistance uh, to civil rights and for equality for African Americans. Mm -hmm. What was your experience like, Robbie, coming from this faith and not fully grasping the history of your religion until you were 26? Was it tough for you to grapple with that in that moment? Once you learned the full weight of that history, was there still an element of kind of wanting to protect uh, the faith or was it something you just dived right into and like, let's, let's learn about this history and really grapple with it. Yeah, no, I, I think it's been a much longer, longer gradual journey. I mean, you know, it's like I said, in my early twenties when I first kind of got this information, it was really unsettling. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I vividly remember, you know, um, sitting in a Baptist history class and, and, and luckily, you know, I actually had a professor um, who was one of the first, um, generations of Baptist historians working inside the seminaries who told it straight. And he just said, look, you know, there's, there's really no getting around this. Slavery was the primary you know, reason for the, the split between the Northern and Southern Baptist for the founding of the denomination. Uh, and he used to say, that's a cold historical fact, you know? Um, mm. uh, and I, I remember that really sitting with me and our, you know, talking about it with, with others and most of whom had also never heard this uh, before, but I think it just sat with me, um, you know, while, and, and part of it is that, you know, I, I grew up, I mean, fairly protected by that world, um, you know, so in, when you're, when you're inside that world, um, it's doing all kinds of things, uh, you know, for you, it was a community, it was, uh, you know, places where I, like, I, you know, I learned how to run a meeting with Robert's or rules of order, you know, inside a Baptist <laughs> church. I mean, so all kinds of things, uh, friendship, family, um, it's, you know, not so easy, I think, to sort of just move away. So, you know, I'd say, honestly, it's been, you know, a three decades long journey of kind of putting the pieces together, um, you know, until they kind of come to a, a sort of clarity um, that, I, that I've kind of tried to outline in the book. Uh, also, I wanted to, for the, for the audience's benefit, that you're still an active um, member, you're still a, a believer, you're, you're still a, a man of faith. Yeah, no, I still consider myself, uh, although I have kind of walked, uh, you know, out of the Southern Baptist fold, um, you know, I, I, but I certainly still consider myself, yeah, a, a Christian and a Protestant, kind of broadly speaking, Protestant, Protestant Christian. Yeah, someone who still, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that, um, you know, this book is um, not not one standing outside, you know, throwing rocks at a, at a, at a house, but um, it's somebody from the inside. Um, you know, the first work, uh, the first sentence in the book has the word I in it. The last sentence of the book has the word us. And then I've tried to write in the first person, um, you know, to kind of integrate my story into this as, as honestly as I can, uh, because I, I think that's important, right? It's in, and, and, and honestly, I, I think I would have better things to do with my life uh, than to spend the time it takes to put a book together. You know, if, if the, the church and, um, and Christianity in general weren't something important to me. Well, and it, like you said, it definitely lands, I think, a bit better when the criticism is coming from within. It's not as though you're an atheist standing on the outside launching this criticism. And I think it, it lands a yeah, bit better. It, it comes a little different from you than like, you know, Sam Harris or <laughs> Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the book, though, you go beyond talking about just complacency and complicity. And you actually talk about the proactive role that white churches played in creating this problem. Um, clearly, it's still a problem today. And we see that with uh, headlines and Donald Trump can come to mind here. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to the problem as it still exists today with white supremacy in American Christianity. Yeah, you know, so uh, the book's kind of got three leg, kind of a three legged stool. It has sort of my personal story. And this is actually the first book I've written with much any, anything might be anywhere close to memoir. And then it, it also has a lot of deep dive history, you know, stuff to kind of um, set the stage. Uh, but, uh, but in many ways, the heart of the book is looking at contemporary public opinion data, you know, um, and, and trying to, to, I mean, the subtitle of the book is the legacy of white supremacy in American Christianity. And, you know, what I mean by that is not just a past legacy, 
the one we're still very much reckoning with mm -hmm. today. I think you're right. We can see it in the headlines. You know, just one. Um, so I have a whole range of uh, public opinion data that I look at that is from PRRI, which is the organization that I, I run kind of as my day job. Uh, you know, and and so looking at the patterns uh, of, of white Christians, and again, I, I should say too that while many may not be surprised, you know, about white that this is a problem in the white evangelical world, that is the kind of part of Christ, white Christianity that's deeply ensconced in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that the public opinion data makes clear is that these problems exist among even the more liberal end of the white Protestant world, the mainline. Protestant world, uh, that is like Episcopalians and Methodists and Presbyterians, uh, that are more <clears throat> populous in the, the Midwest and the Northeast, and among Catholics that are, you know, more urban and more likely to be in the Northeast as, as well. So it, it's across the board in white Christianity. But, you know, just to give you one, uh, one example, um, and we can decide how, how deep you want to go, but one example just right out of the headlines, you know, uh, we looked at the question of what of the um, of perceptions uh, around the killing of African American men by police. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously that's been something that's been all over the news and all over you know kitchen table discussions uh, across the summer, um, fo particularly following the the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. Right. Um, but uh, but there, what was notable is that um, white Christians in general um, are um, a, at least twenty five percentage points more likely than whites who are not Christian to say that these are just isolated incidents, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than a part of a pattern of how police uh, treat African-Americans. So if you ask the question, like, um, is it white Christians or white non-Christians who are closest to the views of African-Americans on these issues? Uh, the answer is very clearly it's, it's non-Christian whites. Whites who claim no religious affiliation have a lot more empathy and are, and are able to see, I think, these issues of systemic racism in a way that uh, white Christianity has really created kind of moral blinders um, for white Christians and really, I think, inhibits their ability um, and, and their willingness, both. I think it's a, it's a matter of will and kind of moral uh, vision uh, here to even see uh, these as significant problems that ought to be of concern. Mm -hmm. And obviously we're talking about white American Christianity. Yeah. Um, do, do, you, do you think those blinders are thrown up um, by some measure – as a result of a reliance or a romanticization, romanticization on on uh, like rugged individualism, you know those kind of the pillars of, of conservative thought. What, what is it that you think is the is the catalyst there? Well, you know, I think it goes back further than that. I mean, the Christianity that was brought, you know, to these shores, uh, for, uh, primarily from from Western Europe and Northern Europe, uh, was already heavily. Um, uh, structured, you know, by by commitments to white supremacy. So you you can go back uh, even before the Protestant Catholic split. Um, you know, way back into the 1400s, there's this thing called the Doctrine of Discovery, um, 1493, um, where the the Pope, you know, issues an edict that says, look, if we uh, if, if a Christian explorer um, encounters uh, uh, lands that are occupied by people who are not professing Christians, they're free for the taking. Uh, right. And the way this played out is it, it played out predominantly um, against black and brown people um, in the in the in the world, in the global south and Africa uh, and, and other places. Um, and and it, it was white supremacists uh, from the beginning. Uh, and so that's the faith that it got brought to these shores. And it justified the wholesale removal and genocide of indigenous people here, Native Americans here. Um, and it, it struck it, it that foundation was already there to support the slave trade um, and the develop of development of the, the particular brand of American chattel slavery um, that, that developed here. That worldview um, and, and what I mean to your point earlier about not just being complicit, uh, but actually being the primary moral just uh, justification, providing that structure to justify this hierarchical worldview where whites were sort of divinely uh, were divinely intended. Uh, to be at the top of the political, social, economic pyramid, um, and everyone else, um, you know, is there to be in many ways of service and to be, quote unquote, civilized, uh, you know, by whites who are clearly the superior race. I mean, this worldview um, was uh, predominantly justified um, by, by Christianity and provided the, the strongest, uh, the strongest of all kind of, of moral justifications that you can provide. And that is that it was handed down by the creator of the universe. Well, I mean, Ephesians... Slaves obey your masters. It's an it's yeah. an edict in the word of God. So it's you know it's it's kind of an easy 
it's not a giant leap. No, not at all. I, I think that's actually quite surprising to, to many Christians today, to many white Christians today who like think, uh, for example, that, you know, uh, they approve of the civil rights movement, looking back on it, you know, 50, 60 years, um, you know, at a distance, uh, have kind of warm feelings toward Martin Luther King, whereas very many few white Christians of his day did. Um, there's a kind of rearview mirror ish way in which yeah. I think white Christians revise the history. But, but the truth is, yeah, that, that white Jesus that hangs on the wall of most white Christian churches has, you know, not only tolerated slavery, segregation, Jim Crow laws, but in fact, that white Jesus that, that most white Christian churches conjured, um, actually demanded those things, um, as a, as an expression of how God wanted the world to be ordered. That's powerful. Well, and that tendency that you're referring to about white people kind of romanticizing the civil rights period, forgetting how Martin Luther King Jr. did not have widespread approval, according to Gallup polls at that time, yeah. and sit-ins at lunch counters were exact, disapproved the exact, of. The exact opposite. Yeah, they were not approved of at the time. Um, you also, in, in the mapping section of your book, you cover stats related to white evangelicals believing that they themselves have warm feelings toward African Americans, but mm. that they actually harbor racist attitudes so it it almost seems like right now they feel as though they have these warm feelings and they support these things when really they're still harboring racist attitudes yeah that's right it's it's been one of the things that you know it's difficult in, in public opinion research um to actually get at these attitudes right because mm -hmm. um, when you're you're asking people on a survey um you know about their attitudes about very sensitive topics i mean public health uh, surveys have the have the similar problems if you're asking about drug use or sexual habits or you know anything that's very private and sensitive. Right. Um, and, and attitudes around race are are, are similar to that. So um, you, you do get these kind of very contradictory things sometimes where if you ask people directly, um, a, as m m many social sur social science uh, surveys have used something like it was called a feeling thermometer, and you just ask people on a scale of one to a hundred, how warmly or coolly do you feel toward various people groups? You try to take them through a battery, African-Americans, Catholics or Jews or uh, uh, immigrants, or, you know, people who have uh, um, some history of discrimination in the country. And you find that on those batteries, um, white Christians perform pretty well. Um, they, they, they self-report um, having these warm feelings uh, toward, uh, toward many of these groups. But then when you get to the issues of policy, um, and the way that society is organized, if you move away again from kind of personal racism and personal ill feelings toward a, um, a, a, a group to uh, how do you, how do I think about how society is organized and how are there injustices in the systems uh, that we've inherited and that we still support, uh, all of that sort of falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and for white evangelicals in particular, we have this kind of, you know, very dramatic uh, paradox where on the one hand they are among the the subgroups in the country that score the the highest on um a uh this this uh, uh feeling thermometer index kind of scoring warmly they also score the highest on this thing that i built in the book called the racism index that in other words they hold more racist attitudes in terms of structure structural racism and those two things are true at the same time mm -hmm. so do you do you believe it's gotten worse over the course of um, the influence that has been gathered over the decades with, you know, characters like Ralph Reed and and the litany of of people I would consider grifters like Jim Baker and Paula White and Pat Robertson said some crazy shit this last week about Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. invoking lesbianism. And I just out of the just out of just insane stuff. But. Robert Jeffress, Franklin Graham, I mean, they're just, they're low hanging fruit here. Is it because of that power accumulation, um, since Reagan on that it's become kind of uh, a mantra that's taught in the churches and they hear it from the pulpit? What do you think? It, Cause there's definitely a difference. You're talking about, you know, how this impacts political space. And, and I think one of the very troubling things that, you know, when you look at the history, you see, is the ways in which uh, white Christianity has uh, also uh, been very much married up to Republican politics, um, and particularly around issues of race. Um, and I think this is also something often something's not seen very often. But if you if you ask, um, how do we get our two political parties today? And so our two political parties are deeply polarized, not just on policy, 
I would say not even primarily on policy anymore. It's about it's about identity. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so there, and so if you look at the self-identified Republicans today, uh, they're two thirds white and Christian, whereas Democrats are only one third white and Christian. So you've got race, politics um, and religion. Right. These three very deeply held pieces of people's identity, all sort of pulling in the same direction um, and, and not checking one another. Um, and it's got, that's gotten worse over the last few decades. But the, the propulsion, the fuel that really uh, kind of leads to this trajectory that, that we're seeing kind of play out in such dramatic ways today um, is really the civil rights movement. And it's, it's the passage of the Civil Rights Acts in 1964 and 1965. Uh, prior to that year, um, to those years, uh, we would be talking about the solid uh, Democratic South rather than the solid Republican South. And, and the way we get that is that once the Democratic Party becomes associated as the party of civil rights um, with the passage of those bills, um, we get a literal white Christian flight from the Republican Party to the, uh, sorry, from the, from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Um, and it's white Christians in the South in particular um, leaving in droves. Um, and, and it really is about um, resisting uh, civil rights movement and, and resisting um, uh, the desegregation um, and the deep South that is the initial fuel that provides, you know, and, and that trajectory has just continued, um, you know, from, from that, uh, from that point on till today. So I think when you see the players, many of which you just named, um, you know, they're drawing on, you know, five to six decades now of what, you know, has been called the Southern strategy. And that is kind of a right. strategy the Republicans use to exploit racial fears and whites in the South uh, to gen up votes uh, for for Republican candidates, um, and and we're we're seeing that um, I you know I, it feels to me in, in many ways like you know um, something that was deliberate it was done kind of quietly um, and subtly and it's now kind of a runaway freight train um, you know and even when the when the RNC the Republican National Committee um, admitted and and apologized. Uh, for the use of the Southern strategy in 2005, um, that train, I think, had had too much momentum to be very easily de derailed. And we see it, I think, barreling full steam ahead today. Yeah, we've talked about the Southern strategy and Lee Atwater and uh, yeah. Nixon on through Reagan. And I, I really do. I think that the Southern strategy was a tool used hand in hand with religion or I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's like the age old question that I'm just creating now. <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, which which group kind of absorbed the other or was it just kind of a wink and a nudge nudge and we're going to get this done together between the Republican Party and white evangelicals? I mean, yeah. it, it's hard to say well, which th one led the led the parade. I'll be blunt here. I mean, I, I think the the common cause was the protection of white supremacy. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the glue. Um, it wasn't abortion. It wasn't uh, opposing. LGBT rights. I mean, these are the things that people put forward, right? Because those are, I think, more respectable. People can have kind of differences on those things. And you can make, I think, arguments that line up um, with uh, a religious set of values and that are de defensible, even if people disagree um, over them. But the thing that could never be quite put forward, but I think the thing that is the through line here is is the defense of, of, of white supremacy that, that really made that marriage make sense. I mean, it's, it's worth noting, just as a quick aside, that, um, you know, uh, the year that Roe v. Wade uh, was decided, um, the Southern Baptist Convention met um, in the summer following uh, the Supreme Court decision and, and had very little to say um, about it. And what they did have to say was positive um, uh, about uh, they, they basically praised the ruling and their and their official uh, you know, minutes of the meeting. Um, and it wasn't until many years later um, that this uh, this position of opposing legalized abortion kind of got grafted on uh, to the, the Christian right movement. But what the animating piece of it was actually uh, Bob Jones University being threatened to lose its uh, tax exempt status because it had a policy against interracial dating yeah. um, on campus, which ran afoul of the Civil Rights Acts. Well, and given given your primary argument here that 
American Christianity really is was constructed right to protect white supremacy. I'm wondering if you have received pushback from members of your in group or people who are <laughs> critical of your take on wow. this, not accepting it. <laughs> my assumption is that you have, based on the laugh, but also before you laughed, that was my assumption. But <laughs> I'm I'm interested in what the response has been just within Christianity. Sure. You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I will say that at least so far, um, the most vocal uh, comments I've, I've been getting have been um, actually gratitude, probably 10 to 1. Oh, wow. Um, you know, uh, so I, I was prepared on, for man. the opposite. Come on, um, man. Ratio. And no, it's it's been really interesting. Huh. It's been overwhelming silence, mm. uh, you know, from the cohort that you might think of um, uh, defending it. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure what to make of it, actually, um, you know, because, you know, I, there, there's been one big piece by the Catholic League uh, that came out um, sort of, you know, trashing, you mean, trashing the book. You mean Bill Donahue. You don't mean yeah, it's not a real yeah, yeah, organization. Yeah. It's one dude. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Bill Donahue, <laughs> yes, himself, you know, uh, took it upon himself to, um, uh, you know, kind of trash the book. But, uh, you know, that that's really the most prominent thing that I've seen so far. Um, uh, you know, from, from, from that side of things. Uh, so, you know, again, I don't quite know what to make of it. Um, but, but I, th- I think that, um, you know, part of it, maybe the moment we're in, yeah. um, that this, that's just so clear that there is this kind of moment of, of reckoning. And then part of it may be, you know, there are a, a, some voices, um, in, in, in even the evangelical world, um, you know, that I think are trying to speak up, um, on these issues. I mean, J.D. Greer, who's the, the current president, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention has, you know, he w- he spoke up early this summer and saying, you know, we shouldn't, uh, uh, you, you know, kind of wince when we say Black Lives Matter. We should we should be able to straightforwardly say that as something that, you know, uh, uh, so- someone who's a Christian and white uh, should be able to say that with a straight face and mean it. Um, he's talking about retiring. A, a, you know, uh, believe it or not, there's a gavel that's been used to kind of uh, gavel in the Southern Baptist Convention for most of its existence way back, you know, um, uh, pre-Civil War. Um, and he's uh, and the gavel was given by one of the founders of the convention who was a, a slave owner and defended slavery as an authentic Christian, uh, you know, practice. And and he's going to you know, talk about retiring that gavel um, uh, during his, his presidency. So yeah, I think, you know, it may be that there are just some moves being made um, and in my home state of Mississippi, I should say, um, you know, one of my former seminary colleagues is the president of the um, Mississippi Baptist Convention. And I was pleasantly surprised to see the Mississippi Baptist Convention, which is the state arm of the, the national body, um, speaking up and calling on the governor and the, and the legislature in the state of Mississippi to remove the Confederate battle flag from the state flag. Mm-hmm. Well, before we all break our arms, patting those people on the back for doing something that is so clearly the morally correct thing to do, um, a- answer me this question. That was my just being a dick there for a second. But <laughs> answer, answer me this question. What, um, what's the problem here? Why do we, why is it so hard for these leaders of men and women, leaders of their flocks, to actually lead? Why are they always taking up the rear and following from behind and acting in the, you know, the Mormon tradition of after it's become socially acceptable, then you let blacks into the priesthood? Like, what What can we do to see um, some kind of a, a moral sea change here? Yeah, I mean, this is an old question, right? I mean, Martin Luther King talked about you know, instead of the church being a headlight, it was too often a taillight. Oh. Um, ex- exactly the same, you know, kind of I metaphor should, that you I put- should I should have just said that. That's much better than what you said. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I, I think you're right. I mean, it's it's a real. I I mean, I, I think it's it's a couple things. I mean, one is uh, I, I think this goes back. It goes so deep. Um, I think is is one one of the real reasons here, and you know, so to open this door. Uh, does mean uh, that you can't tweak things, all right? If you're going to open this door, it's going to go all the way down, right? You're going to have to look at theology. You're going to have to look at liturgy. You're going to have to look at the hymnal. Uh, you're going to have to look at, you know, everything people do um, when they do church um, and not just what they believe. Um, you're going to have to look yeah. at that picture of the white Jesus 
in the foyer, um, you know, hanging on the hanging on the wall. Um, you're going to look at the nativity scene. Um, you know, I mean, it really is going to be it, all the way down. And I, I think very few uh, religious leaders have been, you know, willing to do that really. And I, I think they know that's where it goes, right. It, it just goes that deep. Um, and, and so I, I think that's part of it. And then there's self-interest, you know, I, I think the, you know, white supremacy, I, I think, isn't just some cultural thing, right. Um, I think it's worth remembering that, um, it, 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 it's a way of organizing society that, that provides economic benefits, that provides political benefits, and it provides power. Um, so, you know, I mean, from, you know, Frederick Douglass on up, you know, I mean, this, this idea that power never cedes anything, you know, uh, without being challenged yeah. um, is, is right. And, and so I, I think it's self-interest. It's certainly um, a lack of courage. Um, I think it's been a lack of vision, but, but I think that lack of vision has been a kind of willful ignorance you know, um, kind of not wanting to see something that, you know, is going to be deeply troubling. Um, that's still with us, you know, very much today. But but I think it's a combination of all those things. But at the end of the day, you know, the white supremacy has been about protecting jobs, has been pr- about protecting neighborhoods. Um, it's really been about, um, prote- you know, giving white people access to money and na- safe neighborhoods and jobs uh, that they've been denying everyone else. And so it's about it is about finally giving giving that unfair advantage up. Well, and I think that's a hard thing to do. Ultimately yeah. protecting the people you sit shoulder to shoulder with in the pews on Sunday morning who happen yeah. to also be the same color as you. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. King had this great line. Um, I, I've been even in the last over the summer. Was it, let, me, let me guess. What's that? Was it something about headlights and taillights? No, no it's a different <laughs> one. <laughs> Uh, no, this other, this other one that is sort of say with me as well, um, it, it goes to your point about sitting shoulder to shoulder, um, is, you know, he described in Letter from Birmingham Jail, I mean, he's writing not to the people burning crosses and throwing bricks. He, he's writing to the, you know, what are considered to be at the, at, at the end of the day, these mainstream respected clergy. That's who he addresses this letter to um, and who have been critical of him and silent and not supportive of the, of the civil rights uh, you know, work in, in Birmingham. Uh, and he's in fact in jail uh, for it. And so he writes this, this letter addressing it to these, you know, uh, people who are seen as respectable religious leaders in the city. And, and he, he's just kind of in dismay. Um, he, you know, he said, well, who, who are these con- people sitting in these congregations, you know, supposedly hearing the message of Jesus, um, you know, and, but, and then he has this line where he says, uh, sitting, uh, they are sitting uh, safely behind their anesthetizing stained glass windows. Hmm. Much better than I- how I said it. <laughs> and this and this idea, right, that 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 that's in a way that the role that Christian theology has played, like rather than enlivening enlivening our moral sensibilities and making us more aware of the work of justice and equality around us, it is in fact lulled white consciousness to sleep. Yeah. Um, so that all they see is the people down the pew from them and they don't see anything uh, as you say, we, you know, it, it, it really does mean that we don't see, um, and we haven't seen, um, outside of, uh, those stained glass windows. But when you think about the history again, I mean, that's by design that is built in. That's not a, you know, to kind of be quippy about it. It's not a bug. It's a feature, mm-hmm. um, in, in white Christianity. Right. Um, and if you think about, you know, religion that grew up and that had to grow up, um, really with this a priori, a commitment to a worldview of kind of whites being superior to others um, that began with it being uh, so ensconced that, that one could actually own another human being that wasn't white. Um, and then all the theology that developed from that point in time had to develop around that idea. Right. So, so nothing could really challenge that idea. That was the, the kind of bedrock. Um, and so when you build a theology on that kind of foundation, um, you know, it, it's distorted, it's distorted top to bottom. Well, in thinking about solutions to this problem, one thing that really jumped out at me about the book 
was your argument that attrition is not going to solve our problems. And Mm. you hear people talk about, well, white supremacy, it's going to die with old white people. They're going to die off and then we won't have this problem anymore. But you make the point that white supremacy has continued to endure generation after generation, that it's not just individual racists that are the problem, that it's actually our racist society, the culture, it's institutionalized. And I think that that's such a powerful point that I actually haven't heard anywhere else. So I read that for the first time in your book, Um, knowing that that kind of makes the weight of this problem seem so much bigger and solutions seem so much more difficult. What do you kind of see as the the next steps in Christians starting this process of reckoning with white supremacy in their faith? Yeah, small question. Um, (laughs) All right. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, I will say that that I think most Americans have a real misunderstanding of, of the way racism works. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that they do see it as inhering in individuals. Right. So right. if we can get rid of the bad individuals, um, you know, we'll we'll be good. Right. We're all good. And and, and I, I, I actually write in the book about this, this remarkable scene on the corner in Richmond, Virginia, when I was doing some research in Richmond. And I was just kind of walking down the street and there was a, a set of older white uh, folks set up who, who were uh, had were flying Confederate flags and had signs up about protect our monuments, our Confederate monuments. And, you know, there was this uh, white guy and another a younger white guy in a car who, who was just so incensed when he drove up to the stoplight and saw this display on the sidewalk that he actually put his car in park, got out of his car, left it running at the stoplight and walked over to them to yell at them. And the main thing he was yelling at them is, is um, you know, he, he said, uh, I just can't wait till you human pieces of shit shrivel up and die. Uh, Cause they were much older than he was. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and then I think the, the idea is that, yeah, then we'll be in a much better place. And while there's certainly some truth that sort of older Americans, particularly older white Americans um, are more likely to hold more racist attitudes than younger ones. Um, the way that that gets reproduced, some of it is passed down from person to person. But but the bigger way that it gets reproduced is through institutions, right? So the, if you grow up with the same theology um, that got built around the idea of white supremacy, um, even in a passive way, you're going to absorb that into your worldview. And it's going to be part of how you see the world. Part, and it's going to structure what you do and don't see as important, what you do and don't see as uh, a, a valid uh, something to worry about in terms of your religious identity. Um, and so all that's there. I think the way to to get to your to your question, though, um, I think the way that um, we we get out of this um, is is that I I think there's a sort of work that that white Christians have to do for themselves, and I think that can start very concretely um, by telling stories, mm. right? Um, and and I think um, you know, so I I try to do that for myself in this book, and kind of lay out um, kind of where uh, you know race showed up for me, but I think for for white Christians. You know, even if they started with a, with this question, you know, something like, okay, why is our church physically located where it is? Yeah. Most of the time, that question, you scratch the surface, and that's going to be about race. Hmm. Um, if it's a, if it's an older church, um, it's going to have to do, you know, it got built in probably a, um, and it's, if it's an older, you know, white Christian church, it probably got built in an area that at one point was um, outside uh, or designated as a white area of the city. Um, if it's a newer church that's out in the suburbs, well, why is it there instead of uh, in the city core, right? Because it's following white flight out into the suburbs. I mean, so I think you get there pretty quickly. But being willing to tell the truth, I think, about, about these things. Um, and then I think the second thing does require some relationships. Um, you know, the, the, um, some of the other survey work we've done shows that we're still so heavily um, socially segregated um, by, by lines of race. So if you ask we ask people in surveys um, about their their close friendship networks, um, and you know the average white person's um, core friendship network is ninety three percent white, um, and seventy five percent of whites have absolutely no one uh, of color and, in their kind of close friendship networks. Wow. And yeah. so I think I think building these these relationships because it, it it is in relationship where assumptions get challenged. Right. right. And I think that that's the biggest part of it is that I think many whites and white Christians carry these white supremacist assumptions that are invisible to them. Um, and it's only by, I think, some telling these stories to surface them. And then also I think being in conversation where somebody can kind of check you and say, what, 
wait, what did you say? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like kind of come back at you a little bit and say, now unpack that for me because that sounds a little odd. And, you know, and it's, but you have to have a real relationship to, um, to have those kinds of conversations. Absolutely. So, you know, the book, I, I highlight two, two Christian churches that are trying to do that, for example, in Macon, Georgia, uh, that, that have this long, very fraught shared history um, of, in fact, the descendants of the African-American church um, uh, were uh, their their predecessors, um, their ancestors were enslaved by the white, uh, the, the ancestors of the white church. So that's the, and, and they've been trying to kind of build some community and it's been very slow kind of organic process, but through building, I think those relationships and connections of trust, um, it has meant that when things have come up, um, they've been in a much better place to have a, have a conversation. And I think particularly for the white Christians in the equation, they've had to do a lot of really difficult work, I think, of um, questioning, I think, a lot of their, you know, uh, very rose-colored history of, the, of kind of where they've been and, and thus kind of where they are. Do you, do you think, I mean, because mainly the, the, the business in which we traffic is politics, not religion here on the show, and certainly not on, on YouTube with what I do there. Um, do you think, and this is, you know, maybe outside of your scope, but do you think that we... Is it possible that we could see some kind of carryover if we start to address this issue within the white Christian church of will there be a ripple effect maybe um, into other issues like poverty or immigration or health care um, that seem to me to be more moral choices rather than I mean, they're clearly policy choices that mm -hmm. that ignore the morality of the issue. Yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge I, I do think is this kind of segregation that we've got. And we just don't have that many institutions. Um, you know, to be honest, I think given how fraught the history is inside of, you know, white Christian churches, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, bet the farm on uh, churches being the place from which positive ripples are going to ripple out. Um, if anything, I think they need help uh, from other institutions, um, you know, that or some things might ripple might ripple in. Sad commentary, though, isn't it? It is, it is, and, and but it is, it is a challenge, right? That um, again, there just aren't that many, uh, you know, institutions that mix people along across lines of race, across lines of social class, um, urban, rural. I mean, these divides are, you know, are are all big and all and and the the ways of kind of getting people to hear each other across these lines. I mean, you know, a lot of there's been a lot of sociological, you know, research talking about these various ways of sorting. That have happened um, in in the country, and I think that's one of the biggest things we're we're fighting against is is that kind of um, coming into contact with people kind of who don't just share your assumptions, whether it's church, whether it's work, um, whether it's you know a community organization, the PTA, whatever. I mean, our public schools were one of the places that this was really the biggest places that this was supposed to happen. Um, and uh, one of the things we've seen is that you know while we saw gains. Uh, from desegregating public schools really into the 80s, we've really been losing ground um, in terms of integrating uh, uh, public schools by race you know, since the 80s. So, I mean, that'd be another place to start, too, because I think we can get get people in school with each other at an early age, um, and which also requires parents uh, to, to mix a bit on sports teams and PTA and all that stuff. Don't they say that right now our schools are more segregated than they were prior to desegregation? I mean, it's yeah, I, it's a problem I, nationwide, not yeah. just in the South either. It's a major problem, even in the northern, you know, New England, where they're all hippie and liberal. Yeah, no, that's right. I think we've lost. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think we, we saw some gains in the 80s and now we've lost. Yeah, pretty much all of that uh, since, since then. Yeah. Well, before we get to our final question, I just want to say that I appreciate you and your book and you're certainly pulling your weight in the reckoning and encouraging white Christians to reckon with this this legacy of white supremacy. And so we definitely appreciate that and would Absolutely. recommend to our audience that they all go check it out. Um, so the question that we like to ask everybody when we wrap our interviews is what is the last thing that you changed your mind about? Yeah. Um, yeah, I tell you, I, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not that morally weighty, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, I, you know, I, I think it's personal. I think it has to do with the pandemic. Um, and, and that is, is that, um, you know, I, that I, I was just too busy to do all kinds of stuff, right? Um, this, this idea that I, I was too busy to exercise, too busy to cook, 
um, you know, that I, I think those things have gone by the gone by the wayside. So I think there's been kind of a rebalancing, um, you know, in, in me in terms of just kind of uh, at least one positive thing that's come out of all this mess um, has, has been a kind of reevaluation. I mean, you know, working from home and it makes it a little easier uh, for sure. But I think this this myth that I was too busy to kind of take on things that sort of feed my soul um, a little more um, uh, that uh, I think that's something I've, I've uh, clearly decided I was wrong about. I, I think that's awesome. Yeah, that's really great. In, interweaving some space uh, and some legitimacy to self-care is certainly not a, a little thing. That's, yeah. a, that's a big, that's a big goddamn yeah. deal. Yeah. And we like to talk about that just to encourage the audience that it's okay to change your mind and even about big things or small things, regardless of what it is. Self-care. That's a pretty big thing, I think. Um, Robbie, how can people find you? You find me at PRRI.org. So PRRI.org. That's uh, the Public Religion Research Institute's website where we have a daily newsletter um, and uh, kind of breaking research all the time. We have uh, upcoming research um, on the election, kind of a big pre-election survey. It's going to be out with the Brookings Institution um, on October 19th. Um, and then the book is available um, at your local bookstore, bookshop.com or Amazon or anywhere else uh, you like to get books. Absolutely. All right. Robert P. Jones, author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, Go out and get the book. It is, it's a fantastic read. Brittany and I have both read it. Uh, Robbie, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you. Thanks so much. I was glad to be here. So one of my favorite things about having a podcast is I couldn't just email him and say, hey, you want to hop on the phone and talk to me for an hour? Yeah. <laughs> I'm able to say, hey, I have a podcast. You want to come on for an interview about your book? Because I read it and I'm like, oh, I, I have... see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm like, I have so many questions. <laughs> I want to talk to somebody about this. This gives you a chance to just talk to the author. Absolutely. And then the podcast is like, no, we've got a podcast. We could make it legit, even though you would have just as soon just talked to him, to chat with him on the phone. Absolutely. <laughs> for sure. We'll invite him to one of our weekend Zoom happy hours and just chat about the book. Well, and let me tell you, I could have gone another hour talking to him because oh, yeah. there's just, well, there's so much information in this book and so much I think that is important about the topic that a lot of people don't recognize. And like I said at the top of the show, I think what is so unique about Robbie is that he's able to communicate these criticisms of American Christianity being a member being a man of faith yeah. and doing it in such a respectful way that seems really non-threatening. I mean, I'm not a Christian, so I can't really speak to that, I guess. But to me, it seems like it's communicated in a way that's non-threatening. What, what's interesting to me is after we hung up with him and we were chatting about how it went, you pointed something out to me that I didn't even realize in the moment. And mm. it's every time that I kept trying to get him back to talk about politics a little bit, you're like, he would just restate the thesis that, yeah, all of that is a problem, but it is all predicated and it all originates in white supremacy and more specifically, white Christian white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That's it really re it really rings true yeah. to me. Yeah. And it's something that needs to be dealt with. And I, I, I can only hope and wish and pray or whatever that members of white Christianity We'll do some, pardon the pun, soul searching mm. and um, look within and, 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 and try to have a little empathy, a, a little a little walking in someone else's shoes, a little do unto others as they, you would have them do unto you mentality. You know, be more Christian, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, we'd love to know what you think. 657-464-7609. Of course, you can always email a voice memo from your smartphone to I doubt it at dollamore.com. Of course, as always, we are a listener supported, listener produced podcast. If you would like to hear more interviews just like this one, go to dollamore.com slash Patreon. You can choose your tier. We send out stickers. There are tiers that have monthly um, Zoom hangout calls where you can actually sit and chat with us for an hour. It's a real good time. We would appreciate the support. Please consider it. We will see you next time. For Brittany Page, I'm Jesse Dollimore, and this has been I Doubt.